Hello, everyone. While everyone is filtering in, I am just going to start um, and announce um, why we're all here today, as well as our speakers. So I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. This is the last webinar of the 2023-24 BCRC webinar series, and today we're going to be covering early calf life survival. Uh, I'm Sydney Fortier, a research and innovative quick in Research and Innovation Coordinator with the BCRC, and I will be your moderator this evening. So we're very excited to be able to put these webinars on for free through the Knowledge Dissemination and Technology Transfer Project, which is funded by the Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff and Canada's Beef Science Cluster. We ask that if you have any questions that come up that you submit them in the Q&A function. It looks like that in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, we don't use the chat for questions. It can get a little complicated, but feel free to go in there and start a conversation. Tell us where you're from. Um, and then at the end of our panelist sessions where they have a chance to present, we will have a live Q&A session where all of those questions will be addressed live. Um, just as a little bit of housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be sending out the recording approximately two to three business days after this live webinar. Um, you'll be receive an email with that recording, but you can find recordings um, of all of our past webinars on our website, under our webinars tab, or on our YouTube channel. And be sure to subscribe to our mailing list or to our YouTube channel while you're there. This webinar, along with uh, an archive of a few others, is available for CE credits if you are a veterinarian or an RVT and attending live and have identified your, yourself as one of those, um, then you should receive your certificates following the webinar. Um, if you are interested in receiving CE credits from any of our past webinars, you will watch the recording via YouTube or our website. And then um, get 80% or higher on the associated quiz. Uh, if you do not receive your certificate following a live webinar or after you have um, responded or after you have filled out and gotten 80% or higher on a quiz, please reach out to myself or Dana Parker and we should be able to help you out there. Just in light of the topic, I also wanted to highlight a couple BCRC resources that we have available on beefresearch.ca. These are our CAF 911 resor resources. Um, in addition to PDFs, we also have videos and they cover topics from tube feeding to claustrum management, calf resuscitation, spotting dehydration, and how and when to intervene with a difficult calving, in addition to um, many other topics um, and more to come. So all of these can be found on our website and are currently being highlighted on all of our social media cha channels, so they should be pretty easy to find there. But without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our lovely panelists. Um, we are going to be hearing from three speakers today, um, and I am going to stop sharing my screen and invite our first speaker, Dr. Roger Richard. Um, to share his while I introduce him, and we will hear from Dr. Windyer and Heidi a little bit later on. Dr. Richard graduated from the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in 1989. He worked in Pilot Mound, Manitoba, before arriving at the Verdon Hospital in 1991. He joined the ownership in 1993 and was involved in all facets of the mixed pra animal practice. As the practice in Verdon grew, Dr. Richard was able to focus on his main interest, beef production. He married his wife, Carla, in 1994 and raised a family of three daughters that are now following their own careers. Dr. Richard left Verdon in 2022 and along with Carla moved their 90 head commercial cow-calf operation north along the south boundary of Riding Mountain National Park. They currently run their herd on a yard site his grandfather started in 1928. Dr. Richard continues to practice bovine medicine out of the Shoal Lake Vet Clinic on a part-time basis. And we are very excited to have him this evening. So, Roger, go ahead. Okay, I'm unmuted. There we go. Okay, thank you, Sydney. And uh, I guess I'll get right into this. I have 10 minutes to get through what I've got on here and it seems through practice, I uh, have a hard time getting it done in 10 minutes, but we'll, 
move along. Um, uh oh, I've run into a glitch here already. Aha. Sorry, my, uh, I can't seem to get my uh, slides going here now. Sydney, I'm not sure if you have any ideas on this one. Yeah, do you want to try using the arrow keys on your keyboard? Yeah, I, that's what I'm trying to do here. Okay, did you try uh, manually right-clicking on your slides? Uh, right-click, yeah, I've tried that. Okay. Now, now everything is gone. My, <clears throat> huh. I don't even have my cursor on here anymore. Uh... <laughs> okay. Do you want to try escaping out of it and starting it again, and maybe? Not sure if I can escape it. Well, there we go. Oh, there you I'm go. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, I think I'm, there we go. Okay, I've got control here now. Uh, okay, so uh, starting uh, with, uh, I'm a little bit frazzled here now, uh, just uh, with early uh, calfhood uh, survival, um, I guess it starts way back with, your, you know, talk to your vet about your reproductive vaccinations for your cows and heifers. Uh, everything else that's on that screen, uh, uh, preg checking is a good time to look at your body condition heading into winter feeding and nutrition. Uh, if your vet is not comfortable speaking on nutrition, particularly in times when uh, feed sources may be short, uh, you you know uh, find a nutritionist that you can uh, get a uh, um, a good relationship with and and discuss that uh, so you can get those cows in good shape. Uh, when the winter isn't as severe and get it done early, um, you know, what do you need to scour vaccinate and what are you going to use, what your time is going to be, are you going to do everything, maybe just your heifers, uh, get your neonate uh, processing protocols and treatment protocols all hammered down and so you have your supplies on hand when you need them. So if uh, Forrest Gump's mom was the vet, she would have been. She would have told him that like or calving's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, for the most part, it's just going to be uh, getting uh, bull calves and heifer calves. But uh, when you come into the, the odd case uh, that uh, requires your intervention, that's where it gets uh, real exciting. And, and you don't know what you're going to find in there when you get your hand in. So just make sure that you have all your supplies ready, gloves, disinfectant scrub, etc., uh, make sure that uh, if you have a calving jack that uh, you use, that your puller is operational and, and ready to go. Nothing worse than uh, uh, grabbing your puller when you need it and, and finding that it's uh, seized up or not working properly. So make sure everything's ready to go ahead of time. Another thing I like to have on supply for sure for calving is to have some oxytocin in the fridge and make sure that it's uh, uh, fresh, uh, fresh for the using. Um, calving stages, uh, three stages to the calving process. Uh, first one, our, our first stage is our pre-labor changes. So you're seeing the utter, uh, uh, enhancement and, uh, and the loosening of the, uh, the vulva and, and that, uh, type of thing in heifers, you may notice that, uh, well ahead, like, a um, you know, up to a couple of weeks ahead of time, whereas in cows, that's going to happen a little bit closer. The other things that happen in there is, uh, you know, the isolation is often the pelvic ligaments, uh, restlessness, uh, stage two starts with the uh, presentation of the water bag, like what's in that slide there. And, uh, that carries on to the, the delivery of the calf. Uh, whole process, you know, should be no longer than probably three hours. Uh, stage three, expulsion of the placenta. Uh, stage two is what we're going to be spending most of our time on here tonight. Uh, stage one, 
if you find that uh, things are stalling out in that stage. Uh, there's a couple of things that you might, uh, you know, come to mind or think about uh, at that point. If if the cow is, uh, you know, you notice that she's definitely dropped her ligaments and and uh, this next slide here, um, I'm just going to have to get my pointer back. Oops. Well, anyway, the the hook bone is the one more anterior on the uh, uh, on on the cow. The pin bone uh, is the one closer to the tail head. So there's a nice uh, ligament that goes across from the pin bone to the tail head. Um, and so, if you notice that that is sunk down, and the cow's been restless and up and down and straining. Uh, it's probably, uh, and that goes on for, you know, several hours, it's probably a good idea to get her in and, and have a check. Uh, the odd thing that you might run into at that uh, uh, point would be either uh, a false labor, in uh, which case when you wash her up uh, and have your ex uh, vaginal examination, you'll come up to a uh, closed cervix. Uh, which is basically going to be big enough to put your finger in and you're going to feel a little bit of a, a roughening around the edge of it, somewhat uh, akin to a cauliflower head. Uh, but you, you'll only, you know, be able to get kind of one finger into a, a normal closed cervix. So if you get that cow in, you have a feel of those tendons from the tail head to the pin bone. And, uh, uh, you know, it's fairly firm. Well, it might just be a case that it's false labor, uh, get your hand in there, feel the for the cervix. Um, and what causes these false labor deals is that the uh, uh, calf's feet are up and pushing up against into the pelvis and just call, causing some discomfort to the cow and getting them to strain. But uh, And in some cases, you'll also feel the feet in there through the vaginal wall. Some people phone and say, well, I can feel the feet, but I can't quite get my hand around it. I can't seem to grab it. Well, sometimes you're feeling through the vaginal wall and feeling, feeling the feet. Uh, the other thing that uh, may come up uh, with a stall out in stage one would be a twisted uh, uterus. Uh, you won't have any water bags show up. Uh, the cow will be, again, just restless up and down, straining a bit, sometimes not showing a whole lot. It, it, it can be quite easy to miss. Um, but uh, if you know you know you notice a cow like that, get her in, have a feel. And what you feel in that case with a twisted uterus is going to be uh, uh, you could kind of a, a spiraling of the vaginal wall as you as your hand goes into the vagina. Uh, in some cases where it's just a partial twist, it almost feels like a ledge in front of the cow's pelvis as you have your hand in there uh, and you're sweeping, uh, looking for the calf. Uh, yeah. And, and in some instances, if it's a full 360 or sometimes even more, you're not even going to get your hand in there. All you're going to feel is the spiraling of the, uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, vaginal wall. And, uh, and you won't come up to where you can get just one finger in. You'll, you know, you might get a couple fingers in, but you, you don't feel that nice roughening of the cervix. So, uh, and in, in that case, it's, to, you know, phone your vet, not sure what's going on. You think it's a, uh, twist, but it's going to require a C-section. So, uh, and stage three, the expulsion of the placenta, typically in beef cattle, I do get a lot of calls about uh, retained placentas. Uh, typically, a couple hours after calving, that placenta is going to be out of the cow. Um, first 24 hours, you might have some luck giving her oxytocin to uh, just to get those contractions going and, and get that uh, placenta out. Another thing I guess I should mention here, uh, if you do have a retained placenta and, and always check if there's another calf there too. So if, if there's some concern, uh, you know, what's going on there, check for a second cap because sometimes uh, they, you know, they won't clean properly and, and you might, you know, find that there is another calf there. So make sure that, that that's not the case. Uh, beef cattle, we're not too concerned about retained placenta. So after 24 hours, uh, there's no real point using oxytocin past that in my experience. Um, and 99% of the cows do fine uh, with a retained placenta as far as beef cattle go. So uh, um, as long as they're eating, drinking, doing, you know, their normal stuff. Don't worry about it. Within a couple of weeks, that placenta will drop. 
what I usually tell people is to give that animal a shot at prostaglandin 21 days following um, calving, and that will hopefully put them through a, a short cycle and uh, clean up any um, leftover infection that's in that uterus. Uh, so stage two, water bag delivery, that's uh, the exciting part for most people. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, it's something that uh, most producers shouldn't really, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the vet, as a veterinarian, you're definitely going to see all, a lot more problems, I think, in, in uh, you know, in your own herd, if you're, you know, have to assist 10% uh, of your heifers and maybe 3% uh, of your cows, I think that's, you know, kind of probably where, uh, where you're looking at. So out of, you know, it, uh, it, it, these assists are, are something that it just uh, your veterinarian usually comes out and everything goes along so much quicker and guys you're they're always saying oh you know how come i can get it well it's just a matter of how many we deal with we see all the problems whereas you're going to just see a you know very few hopefully uh so water bag to delivery should take you know the whole process about three hours i guess the critical times to check if you go out find that uh, there is a water bag showing Heifers, uh, we, I suggest to leave them an hour and a half and cows one hour after you notice a water bag or membranes out. A little bit of the trick to that is, I guess, you know, if you haven't checked for four hours, well, how long has that water bag been out? So, uh, um, and if it's in the middle of the night, uh, you don't want to spend a half hour just kind of seeing what's going to happen. I guess, uh, uh, you know, you could just check things out anyway and see where we're at. But uh, typically after that uh, water bag show, so uh, an hour and a half for heifers, hour for cows. And at that point, you should see at least feet at the vulva. Uh, if there's feet there, you know, have a look. Are the, are, the, are the soles of the feet pointing down or up? If they're down, uh, you know, I guess you can rest easy that probably it is a anterior presentation. If the soles are up, uh, it's a good chance that might be a backwards cow. Uh, the other thing that those soles being up might be uh, front feet and the calf's on its side too or, or on its back uh, in utero. But uh, at any rate, uh, you see those feet there. Uh, I usually tell guys to give them another hour and that calf should be out or, or well into progression of, of things going along. Uh, and uh, so if the head's out and, you know, probably just check her in 10 minutes and hopefully things are on the ground. Um, so at one of those points, either, uh, you go out now, you know, after you see the water bag an hour and a half or an hour for the cows and you don't see anything or, uh, you can, you know, the feet were there and you come, come back an hour, nothing's happening. It's time to get that cow in and, and, uh, uh, help her with an, you know, assist that birth. Um, and. The first thing you want to know is what the presentation is. So are those front feet or back feet? Um, and, you know, if, if you go in, if, if the, the soles are, are pointing down, you, you know, you wash her up, you get your lube on, you have a, a feel inside the vagina, you, you feel, you know, those feet pointing down, you feel a nose, odds, you know, chances are, it, well, it is, coming forward so uh, as if you have that nose there you're good if you if you don't have a nose there then uh you want to do a little more uh, exploration make sure you you, what, you know what you got for feet so um if you look at a cow and if if you know you're kind of thinking about this well is that a front foot or back foot just stand back look at that carbon copy of what you're trying to pull out and uh you'll notice that uh the front the the fetlock is the joint right above the hoof uh, front and back feet, fetlock, they both um, flex to the back. Uh, and if you move your hand up the, the, um, the, uh, up past the, uh, the fetlock, on the front foot, you're going to come up to the knee, and that knee is going to bend the same way as your fetlock does on the front foot. Uh, if you look at the back foot, you go up from the fetlock, you're going to get up to the hock. And you notice that the flexion is opposite to the to the um, to the fetlock. 
So that's kind of a good way to tell if you, or it's the best way to tell if you have a front foot or a, or a back foot in your hand. Uh, it gets a little complicated. Uh, uh, again, if you don't have a head there or, uh, uh, or you might have three or three feet or four feet, if there happens to be twins to, to make sure that you have either two front feet or two back feet. And then the next thing is make sure that those two front feet or two back feet belong to one calf. So follow up as high as you can. And, and uh, um, if you, once you come up to the body of the calf and, you know, come around and see if you can find the other foot that belongs with it. So, um, uh, so if you go in, majority of your calvings are going to be anterior position. You're going to have a head there. That's not going to be too far away. Uh, you're going to want to know whether it's alive. Uh, you can either pinch the toes of the calf, and if you get a pullback on the toe, that's a good sign of life. Uh, if uh, you don't get a pullback on the toe, uh, work your way up to the calf's head, get your hand in its mouth, have a feel of its tongue, give it a little squeeze, and, and you should be able to feel uh, a wiggle of that tongue. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's alive, you want to pull that calf in a manner that uh, is going to keep that calf alive and, and get it out in good shape. So the next thing you're going to be going to is chain placement on those feet. Uh, in that slide that you see there, uh, that is the, um, uh, the best way to have your chain on, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you, uh, you have one loop above the fetlock and a half hitch on the pastern area below the fetlock and above the hoof. Um, if you want to do a little experiment at home, just put your chain on uh, above your wrist. And uh, just if you want to just put one loop on there and give it a tug and just feel see what that feels like. And, and then uh, do it again with a half hitch over your wrist. And then try that, pull them out and just see what that feels like. And you'll get an indication why it's important to have uh, uh, a double loop on a leg when you're pulling it. If the leg is a long ways into the cow and you're, you're pulling it up into the pelvis uh, you, and, and you're having a hard time keeping a double loop on, just put a single loop on. But when you're using a single loop, just put it uh, in the pastern area uh, above the hoof. Uh, and then, then you can pull it up with that. And uh, before you're gonna, you know, do any kind of hard pulling, make, try make sure you get your, your double loop on. Um, assist technique on a, uh, a anterior presentation with a head coming uh, is, um, oh, I'm gonna go back to this slide here. You see how that calf is positioned in there. The feet are well ahead of the nose um, and the elbow, if you work, you see the fetlock uh, just above the hoof, then you go to the knee that is right under the chin of the calf. And then under the ear you see, is where the elbow is. Um, that elbow is in an extension there and you can see how far those feet are, are ahead of the calf's nose. As that calf gets pushed up into the pelvis, a lot of times you'll find that those the toes of the calf and the nose of the calf are almost evened up. Uh, and when that is happening, that elbow is going to be in a uh, flex position instead of an extended position where you see right there. Um, so determining whether that calf's going to come safely through the bony pelvis there on your pole. Uh, what you're always concerned about is, is that chest coming through the, uh, the bony pelvis of the cow without damaging it. Uh, the best way to, in my experience, to uh, determine whether that calf is going to pull is uh, have your chain placed on the foot, one person pulling, and if you can pull that foot out so that that elbow gets extended um, and do the same thing with the opposite leg, then yeah, and often when you do that, you're going to feel a little pop as that as that elbow extends uh, into into the pelvis. You should have the fetlock kind of well out of the uh, of the vulva at that point. Uh, have a feel. Make sure that the head stayed in place so that the head's still in the pelvis. If you got both elbows extended straight out and the the fetlock's out, then you're you're good to pull. Um, uh, I'm going to try and get my pointer going here. 
Uh, is it, do you see a point? I guess, yeah, there is a point around there. I guess it is going. Um, I guess when I have my pointer going though, it messes up my, can't get my slides going here for some reason. Okay. Well, I'm stalled out on my slides here again. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, let's see. I was going to mention if you're going to if if it's going to be a hard pull, you have the cow standing in a chute. I typically like to lay that cow down if I figure it's going to be a relatively hard pull. If it's twins uh, or obviously a small calf, it's going to be an easy pull. I'll, I will do it standing. Um, but I, yeah, if you have the cow down, you know, uh, you know, you know that nothing's going to change halfway through your pull. Um, in my early years, I did run across, you know, trying to pull these animals standing, uh, and having the cow go down partway through. And, you know, sometimes they end up in a position where they're sitting down on their bums and, and they're on the calf and it, it can turn into quite a problem. So I do like to cast the cow. The way I do that, uh, put a lariat around the neck, uh, bring the rope uh, back down uh, along one side of the cow behind the shoulder and um, uh, throw the rope over top of the cow's back. Have It's nice working with a buddy if, if you have one around for this job so they can put the rope uh, back under the cow, have a cane in your hand so you can grab that rope without getting kicked, um, bring that rope up, and slip it underneath um, your your. So you, I guess when when the lariat's going from the neck, with the, maybe I should try my pointer again. No, I can't. Okay. Um, yeah, as you grab that rope, it's going back behind the shoulder. Just hold it with one hand. Throw the the tail of of your lariat over top of the animal's back. Bring it under the belly, and then uh, put it underneath the uh, the loop so you have a half hitch basically behind that front shoulder bring it back into the flank area of the cow just ahead of the back leg do the same thing tail of the of the uh, uh, lariat over top of the back and brought back under so that you have a half hitch there and then pull straight behind the cow and, and typically one person and one small person can put a big cow down without uh, too much trouble um so when you're pulling that calf um, uh, into your presentation, uh, if you like to use a puller, I don't have any problem with that as long as you get those uh, legs engaged like we discussed earlier. Um, you should be able to pull that uh, chest through the pelvis without injuring that calf. So um, when you're pulling, uh, you want to pull that calf straight out until you get the chest out through the vulva. Uh, and then at that point, you can uh, start pulling down towards the cow's hocks so that you're um, uh, just kind of curving the calf through the, uh, uh, through the, um, the, the pelvis of the cow. And, uh, but you don't want to, before you get the chest though, you don't want to start pulling down because you're putting pr more pressure on that calf's chest and, and you want to make sure that that's clear of the, the cow's pelvis before you start doing that. Uh, in a uh, posterior presentation where you're dealing with the back feet, um, I guess it's a little bit more difficult. I don't think it's more as clear cut as far as what is an easy pull. Uh, a lot of times um, I end up, you know, I end up putting my puller on uh, and just feeling with my hand how much room there is over the calf's tail head to the to the pelvis of the of the of the cow. Um, and basically you tend to hit a wall. Uh, you won't get the hocks of the calf out and you're already, you know, hitting hitting where there's bone to bone. Um, from the cat, the tail head of the calf to the, the top of the pelvis of the cow. So uh, at that point, it's uh, going to be a C-section on that. Now, if uh, the, you know, the hocks uh, get ex uh, exteriorized and um, and the tail head, there's room, you know, it's coming through into the pelvis, uh, you want to pull that calf all the way straight because the last thing to come out of that cow is going to be the calf's chest. So, um 
just uh, when you're pulling that one, just make sure you're pulling straight out the back, no curving down towards the, the cow's hocks. Um, uh, time limit to reposition. So if we're running into um, issues, uh, here's one of the uh, BCRC, uh, um, uh, they're one of their uh, things that you can get off their website or uh, we have these at the vet clinic as well. Uh, that's one side of that sheet and this is the other one. So it's, it is a handy one to have, but it just gives you the position. So it's showing there, uh, well, it's got where it's not dilated, uh, posterior presentation in the middle, um, and one leg back, you know, head back, uh, and then a full breach at the bottom right. Um, the, uh, and, and I guess, you know, as far as the producer's experience with, with uh, repositioning pulling calves, uh, really depends on, on per each person and how many head they have and how, you know, uh, how much that they've done. But uh, I, I know, you know, a lot of my producers can get a breach out and, and uh, do a lot of their positioning, that's for sure. If you have a head back on a heifer, uh, my suggestion is just phone your vet. Uh, very, very, very few of those are going to be uh, something that you're going to be able to pull in a heifer if the head is back. And if it's a cow with a calf and a head back, that's worth, uh, do, you know, trying. But if it's on a heifer, just it's going to be a C-section. In my experience, you can I, I pretty much guarantee it's going to be a C-section. So bring that one in. Um, uh, yeah, I guess we'll leave if anybody has anything specific about that to the end how are we doing for time sydney you can butt in on me anytime you want if you if uh things are if this yeah. is the cabbage yes i was gonna say we're i think we've hit your time limit a bit okay. but if you okay. have uh, just a few more slides to go through feel free, uh, free to wrap up okay i'm just gonna show the slides you'll see what's on them if you have questions about them uh we'll we'll cover that in the q a but um uh, let's see. Yeah. So I was just talking a little bit about, you know, calf processing at birth, what's going on. I know uh, Claire's going to be covering some of that too. Uh, and, and then I, I was going to talk a little bit about the neonate itself from one to three weeks, scours, pneumonia, you know, hernia ish or umbilical issues, um, broken legs, etc. Um, so if there's questions on that, we can cover that in the Q and A. But uh, I guess for now, I'll pass it on to our next speaker. Thanks so much, Roger. And yeah, we'll definitely be able to address that in the Q&A. So no worries whatsoever. Um, good. I'll mute and I'll get out of the video and we're good to go. That's great. And I will introduce our next speaker. So next up, we have Dr. Claire Windyer. Dr. Windyer attended the University of Guelph where she completed a bachelor's of science degree followed by a doctorate of veterinary medicine. After graduation, she went into rural mixed practice in Southern Alberta. Claire then returned to the Ontario Veterinary College to pursue a doctorate of veterinary science focused in ruminant health management. Dr. Windyer has been recognized for her contributions to academics and leadership and has volunteered in global initiatives, including the Healthy Yak Project along the trekking route to Mount Everest. She joined the Department of Production Animal Health at the University of Calgary Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in 2011, and she was a participant in the Cattlemen's Young Leader Program in 2013. Dr. Windyer lives on a small acreage near Dog Pound, Alberta, with her partner Bruce and their four horses. So please join me in welcoming Claire. Thanks, Sydney. Uh, that number needs to be updated to seven. We have a, a horse problem, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. I am super excited. I am not sharing my, am I sharing my screen already? I can't see. Sorry. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. You think I'd done this before or something. Um, yeah. So I am super excited to be here this evening to chat with you all about probably my favorite topic, uh, which is the care of newborn beef calves. Um, so as long as I can get my slides moving. Um, so Dr. Roger already talked to us about how to get the calves out. Um, so I'm gonna pick up from there and talk about the next thing we need to do, which is getting them breathing because a calf that doesn't breathe um, doesn't last very long. So we're gonna start here with um, a little poll, Sydney, if you're able to launch that poll for me. 
We're about halfway through and that's when the students start fading. So I thought I'd wake y'all up with a poll. It should be launched. So you can click any of the ones that apply there um, that are things that you would use um, to try and get a newborn calf breathing. And I find um, I like asking these kinds of questions because it helps me kind of understand what's going on out there um, on your farms and, and where, um, you know, the work that we do here um, can be the most useful for you. So uh, always curious to know um, what people are doing. I don't know, Sydney, do you see if we're getting answers or not? I can't see that at my end. Yeah, we're getting some answers and they're still rolling in quite consistently okay. here. So yeah, once we hit like okay. half the participants, maybe that oh, we're over Perfect. half now. Okay, I'll let you keep rolling on that and maybe I'll keep going. Or do you think we have enough that we can show it? Uh, I, yeah, nothing's changing too crazy. And okay. so I'm going to end it now. But Everybody else is wash, washing dishes or doing something else. Perfect. Okay, so we've got lots of people rubbing them vigorously, some with a muzzle, a few people using the McCullough and the laryngeal mask airway. Cool. Um, and we got a few people hanging them upside down and everybody's trying something. So that makes me happy. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of those things. Um, so just to kind of get to the basics, of course, the sort of transition from being a fetus living in a nice, warm, cozy, safe environment of a uterus to going out into the big, bad world um, and breathing for the first time is probably the biggest transition that any animal goes through in their life. Um, and so we don't want to make that any harder. So this is one of my little soapbox things some of you may have heard before. Um, we really want to try to avoid hanging calves upside down because um, that essentially just makes it harder for them to breathe at a time when that's already, they've got enough challenges. We don't want to be making it any harder um, but of course we don't want to just stand there and do nothing. Um, we want to try and get these calves going. Um, so we'll talk about a few of the things that we can do instead. Um, so first and foremost, we want to get those calves into, um, the calf recovery position. So as you can see here, this calf is up on its chest, its head is between its front legs, and this allows the lungs on both sides of that body equal opportunity to expand with as little resistance as possible. And the trick that I've picked up over the years is if you take those back legs and pull the feet up by the armpits or by the ears, that kind of stabilizes the calf because otherwise they tend to just push their legs out and pop themselves over back on their sides again. Um, this kind of makes them stuck there um, in that in that position so they can't move um, while they get, get their air going and they start breathing. Um, we can also then, once we have them in that position, um, do anything we really can to irritate them, essentially be the annoying little brother, little sister when you don't want to wake up. Um, so we stimulate them, rub them with towels, um, you know, poke them in the nose, as you can see here, um, with either a piece of straw or a finger or a pen. Um, you can stick your finger in their ear like a wet willy, um, it's really annoying. Um, and essentially we're trying to get them to cough or sneeze or gasp which um, helps get that airflow going. If they really don't wanna breathe, there are a few um, devices and it's nice to see some of you are already using these. Um, so on the, I think it's your left, um, is the laryngeal mask airway, which is a device used in human emergency medicine. Um, and we've looked at that um, in, Amer in experimental studies here at the university. Um, and we compared it to the McCullough mask respirator, which is this guy. Um, and I like to tell the story how before we did this study, I, I thought the only good for these things was collecting dust in barns. Um, but long story short, we actually found both of these devices um, were effective at delivering air to calves uh, that weren't breathing in an experimental um, situation. So if anyone has questions about those, I'm happy to chat more about them in the panel discussion or the Q&A. Um, but I want to make sure we have time for Heidi. So I won't talk more about those for now, and I'll just keep rocking and rolling. Um, so once we get those calves breathing, of course, the next thing we want those calves to do is get up and get going. Um, and so here's our second poll, if you wanted to run that for me, Sydney, if you don't mind. It's live now. Okay, perfect. So we've watched these numbers change over the years. So I'm really curious to see where we are now with using um, pain drugs for assisted cow-calf pairs after a, a tough delivery. Um, so you can either treat the calf, treat the cow, 
um, using a steroid or an NSAID um, or more than one of the above or none of the above. So you can pop in there what you do and I'm gonna keep going just in the interest of time. But whenever you feel like the numbers are good, Sydney, maybe you can show them to us. Oops, if I can move my slides, there we go. So we looked at um, calves that were unassisted. So those are gonna show up here in a moment in green. Um, calves that are easy pulls that are gonna be shown in yellow and difficult pulls that are shown in red. And what we did is we took blood from these calves after they were born and we measured biomarkers, which are essentially a substance that is in the blood. Um, and in this case, the biomarkers were AST and CK. Doesn't really matter what they are, um, but the um, sort of take home is that those are markers in the blood that show damage to muscles. Um, so it's a way of a, a way for us to kind of understand how much trauma those calves have been through. Um, and so we found calves that were difficult poles had significantly higher biomarkers in their blood for muscle damage, showing that they had significantly more trauma. Um, and interestingly, unassisted and easy pulls were not different. So those easy pulls aren't really having too, too much trauma, but those hard pulls really, um, you know, it shows that there was quite a bit. And so it looks like you all are doing a great job of using NSAIDs, um, both in the cow and the calf. That's super nice to see. Thank you for sharing that information. So that takes us to, so we know these calves are going through a fair amount of trauma what can we do about it? And so there's been a number of studies over the years, a growing body of evidence on using paid meds after a difficult calving. Um, so for the calves, um, we've looked at meloxicam and others have looked at it in dairy, uh, dairy calves, and we see greater milk intake, improvements in vigor, greater weight gains in that first week of life. Um, and a study we just finished um, doing recently, we found that those calves, beef calves, spent more time playing and were more active in the first 24 hours, which is great because it means we can kick them out of the barn um, sooner because they're they're up and doing what they should. Um, and then the studies have also looked at ketoprofen um, and have seen similarly more play and investigative behavior and less time lying on their sides. For the cows on the meloxicam side, they've shown more time at the feed bunk, more activity, and potentially more milk production, obviously dairy studies there. Um, and on ketoprofen side, uh, lower levels of retained placenta, less time lying on their sides and more time lying comfortably. So I think all this together shows us, you know, using these NSAIDs after difficult calving shows uh, much better behavioral, you know, signs that these calves are, and cows are feeling better um, and have better well-being as well as productivity. So that takes us to our last part of all of this. And this is something I could probably talk about all day. So 10 minutes was a big challenge, Sydney. Um, but we, let's talk about getting them fed. And so this is our last poll. If you want to launch the last one, please. It's and live. So, oh, thank you. Um, I'm really curious about how people are using scour vaccination protocols out there um, in the real world. Um, and so just wondering if, you know, your heifers are getting the two doses and the cows are getting one dose, which is what's labeled on those scours vaccines. Um, if you're doing something, some part of it, um, you know, heifers, often we see people giving them to heifers, but not cows. Um, you can vaccinate the calves um, or not at all, or maybe you have another protocol. So if you can answer that, I'm really curious to see what you all are out, out there doing. And in the meantime, I'm going to continue onward here. So Dr. Roger already mentioned this a little bit, but you know, our, our calving season really starts long before we ever get to um, calving. And we need to think about our colostrum management long before the first calf drops. And so really, um, you know, it starts with the dam vaccination. And your timing is perfect, Sydney. So we see a lot of people doing the frill program, fair number of people not using any scours vaccines. And not every herd needs it, right? It really depends on your disease risk. Um, number of people using the calf vaccine, which is interesting, um, and some other various combinations. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, you know, I think one of the things that's really important to remember is your colostrum management, your colostrum quality is only going to be as good as your dam vaccination, and your dam vaccination protocols are only going to be as effective as your colostrum management because the protection from those vaccines, the antibodies don't go directly in the calf when it's in utero, it goes through the colostrum. So if you want those vaccines to be effective, you have to have good colostrum management. 
The other part, oops, if I can get my slides moving, that we need to remember is some of the aspects around pre-calving nutrition, and Roger mentioned this as well. Um, you need groceries to respond to a vaccine, right? So those cows have to have good nutrition um, to be able to make good quality colostrum. And then, of course, the last part, the last sort of cog in the wheel here is knowing when and how to intervene with colostrum, because, of course, these are beef calves. We hope we don't have to do anything, that the cows and calves do their jobs, um, but we need to know when and how to help when we should. So that's what we're going to spend the last few minutes here going through, um, and we're going to start with the who. So the who is... Where we go? There we go. Um, assisted deliveries. We know those calves are at highest risk of not getting enough colostrum. Um, calves with a weak suckle reflex aren't going to get up and suck as quickly. Um, and we can talk more about that if anyone's interested. Um, twins and, of course, um, our orphans and mismothered mis calves are all sort of our risk or at risk group that we want to make sure are getting um, help to make sure they get enough colostrum. The when, when do we intervene? So these, I've been playing with my animations, you can tell. So we used to always think that, you know, we had 24 hours to get colostrum into calves. Um, we've learned that really the efficiency is the best during that first one to six hours. So the antibodies that come in, a lot more of them are gonna get absorbed into the gut and then into the bloodstream in that first one to six hours. Um, later, if we, that rest of that first day, a lot more of those antibodies aren't going to be absorbed. And so we have a lot poorer efficiency of absorption. They still can absorb some, but it's not as good. So that early, early intervention is really key. Oops, more animations for you. I'm very proud of those. Um, okay, so, oops, get my slides moving again. So the what, this is always sort of what, what colostrum should we be feeding um, calves? And so we've looked at the average beef cow in Alberta, and, and they have about 150 grams of IgG in their colostrum, um, which is way higher than we expected and, and uh, a pretty nice high concentration. Um, and so if you compare that, you know, our beef cows are relatively low yield, but high IgG concentration. You compare that to our dairy cows, they're going to have high yield, but they have very low IgG concentrations. Like we're talking 70 grams per liter. So less than half the concentration um, of what our beef cows typically make. So it's just not the same product. Um, it's really not what our beef cows are expecting. Um, so we want to avoid that dairy colostrum also because it, it poses a biohazard risk that we want to try and avoid on our herds. So we want to go with our dam's colostrum first and foremost, if we can, depending on how rangy she is. Um, colostrum from another dam on your herd obviously is a, is a second best, especially if you got something in the freezer ready to go. Um, it's great to have a good high quality colostrum replacement product because sometimes you've got nothing and you need it. Um, so you always want to have that in your toolkit and ready in case um, you, you have no other options. And we want to try to avoid using that dairy colostrum whenever possible. Um, then of course we picked what kind we're going, what kind of colostrum we're going to use. The next question is going to be how much should we feed? Um, there isn't really any science on this um, on the beef side, so we've done a little bit of research about this. Um, and so we looked at a liter of high concentration colostrum, two liters of high concentration colostrum, and 1.4 liters of moderate um, concentration colostrum. So that being the calf choice total. And we followed these calves forward and watched how long it took them to nurse from their cow for the first time. Because essentially that's what we want them to do, right? We want to get them up and going and mothering up um, and off to the races. So um, we found that the, the um, calves that got the moderate volume of moderate concentration colostrum actually nurse significantly sooner than the other two groups. So we kind of call this the Goldilocks effect, um, that moderation was key there. Um, and then we also, of course, looked at how much pass, how much IgG those calves absorbed. And essentially, almost all of the calves got adequate levels of colostrum in that study when they were all fed within one hour of birth. So it didn't matter so much, um, except for the fact that we were in there early and quick, um, I think is really why we had such good success with those um, in terms of the passive immunity. So we, from this, we take away that any high-risk calves should really get one and a half liters of colostrum immediately after birth um, is sort of the, the summary of that. And I can talk more about that research if anyone is interested. And then, of course, people always want to know how. How do we feed it? Should we bottle feed? Should we tube? So, of course, we asked that question as well and did a research study 
Um, so we looked at the bottle, we looked at the tube, and then of course some of our calves didn't want to drink the bottle. So we had this third group um, of combo tube and bottle. And again, we followed them forward to see how long it took them to nurse. The combo calves were significantly longer um, while the bottle fed calf fed, uh, bottle fed calves, sorry, um, nursed significantly sooner than the other groups. Um, so what we took this to mean, oops, sorry, I got one more slide before I say that. Um, so it didn't matter which method we used in terms of the colostrum IgG statistically, there was no statistical difference. Um, but when we looked at the numbers, we were a little bit concerned. So all of our bottle fed calves had enough, got an absorbed enough colostrum. Um, our combo calves got half of them had enough. Um, half of them were at sort of moderate um, amounts of colostrum that was absorbed. And then on our tube group, a bit more than half were um, adequate levels, but we had a few calves in that group fail. And so again, this was not statistically significantly different, um, but we wonder if maybe there wasn't something there that those calves that were tube fed were maybe just not absorbing the colostrum as well um, and happy to chat more about that as well. So we conclude from this, um, bottle feeding is best. Tube feeding is better than waiting. So, you know, some calves are just got, not gonna nurse. I've, I make all my, my vet students uh, try to bottle feed a stupid baby and they realize how much of an exercise and patience it is. So, you know, if it's two o'clock in the morning, tube feeding is still better than waiting till the morning. Um, but we do think that, you know, these calves that are offered a bottle and don't finish it are some that we should probably keep a close eye on and make sure that they are um, getting up and sucking from their dam or getting a second um, feeding sometimes, sometime afterwards. So we've talked about getting them breathing. We have talked about getting them up and we have talked about getting them fed. Um, so hopefully in all that, there are some tools that you can uh, take away and put in your toolbox to help keep our calves um, healthy so we can all wean lots of heavy live calves because in the end, that is the goal. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I guess we're gonna wait till the end to talk about that. I see there's some in the Q and A, but wanna make sure we have lots of time to hear from Heidi as well. Thank you so much, Claire. That was so great. And I uh, look forward to asking a few of my own questions to you in the Q&A. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I'm going to introduce Heidi and invite her to share her screen. She's our last speaker for the evening. And then we will move into our live Q&A. Um, but Heidi, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your presentation. Um, so Heidi got into ranching by keeping cows on the trail with her trusty pony at her family ranch in the mountains of British Columbia. She enjoys the unique adventure each season brings throughout the year, especially being able to keep cows happy and healthy. WA Ranches at the University of Calgary is extra special due to the challenge of research, visitors and students on top of the tasks of running a ranch. Bennett takes pride in bringing positivity and patience to work every day and appreciates research that supports fellow cattlemen and the industry. She shares her ranching journey with her husband, Johnny, who is the ranch manager at WA Ranches. They are raising their two kids, Dusty and Billy, ranch style in a cabin in the woods northeast of Cochrane. So please join me in welcoming Heidi. Hello. Um, thanks for the introduction, um, Sydney. And it feels a little bit strange being on this side of a webinar. I'm usually tuning into these BCRC events and taking notes. So it's an honor to have been asked to share my story and Really, that's all I'm, I'm going to be doing is um, share my experience with calving and, and ranching. I, this is my 24th calving season coming up here. Um, that's without my Bugaboo Ranch experience when I was free labor back in the day, but that's where I got my start. So I still appreciated it. Um, I definitely understand the challenges that come with ranching. And uh, I know that every ranch is different and uh, it has to work for you. So I'm not about, you know, having you change the way you do it if it works for you. But uh, our goal here at WA that Johnny and I work hard at is, is just sort of preventing some health issues and, and getting, um, you know, cattle onto the grass as best we can. So that's, that's what we, we focus on here. And, you know, just looking at this first slide here, this is kind of the way we want to calve our cattle, right? We've got uh, that 
pair on the left that's mothered up and we tagged it yesterday and that's that's exactly where she calved right or in the area and the one on the right's just wobbling to his feet and looking for the grocery aisle and doesn't look like any wind because the stockpiled grass there is still standing straight and the sun sunrise it's going to be uh you know just another day at the wa i suppose right that's the way ranching is all right um not sure why my screen's not sharing oh dear we're moving along here that's what do i have going on here Uh oh, I'm having this. Have you, yeah, have you tried clicking with your mouse and using the arrow keys? Clicking with my mouse and the arrow? Yeah, just those are two different oh. options. Sorry. Okay. There you go. All right, there we go. We're back. Um, yeah, so the WA Ranch is owned by the University of Calgary and it's continued to be a working cow calf ranch as before the, the gift. Uh, with the additional interest of research projects and vet teaching and some community um, tours and that sort of thing. But one of the most important things that Jack Anderson and his daughter Win Chisholm wanted to keep going was the animal care and welfare priority at the WA Ranch. And so Johnny and I work hard at, at honoring the gifter's wish as well as, as ourselves personally. We think that's the right thing to do. And again, that, that ties into this, this management um, you know, strategy of keeping healthy calves and, and uh, avoiding having to, to do a lot of tr treatment and that sort of thing. So, okay. okay. There we go. So when I was asked to do this presentation, I kind of was reflecting on, on what makes uh, me so successful myself or and why I'm so good at, at kind of herd health and, and calving cattles and that sort of thing. And it really comes down to, um, to this. Um, you know, it, and this is just for your reaction. This is kind of my point. This isn't any new sort of uh, acupuncture treatment that we've come up with here. This is probably pretty painful. And I'm sure this group of people that are tuning in, um, you know, you're already doing these things. When you see a, a cow problem, you're going to deal with it because you've probably worked all day and now you're tuning in for more information on your cattle. But, uh, you know, you really have to have empathy for your cattle to, to be successful. And um, you need to spend time with your cattle and you need to know what the normal behavior is. So you can really see when something's off or something's wrong. So you can step in and help them, um, you know, as part of this whole prevention planning, right. And, you know, someone can have all the knowledge in the world on, on these diseases and all this information, but if you're not actually thorough um, and looking for it and, and, and then following through with doing something about it, you're not going to be that as successful as you could be. So, um, and I understand at the beginning of this calving season, calves are pretty darn cute. And by the time you get a hundred or so on the ground, they're not so cute anymore and you get tired out, but you need to kind of just keep, keep going and, and don't take any shortcuts and, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a long, long season sometimes and mentally it can be pretty hard on, on a person or a crew, but, uh, you know, maybe ask for some help there too. So that's kind of my first tip there, right? Give a damn about your dam and her herd mates. And, uh, I'll have to say at the end of this event here, we pulled quills out of about 10 cows. Uh, I actually felt sorry for the uh, porcupine because I think he got pretty worked over. Um, my next tip is actually about the real the real calving time, uh, and uh, we we do calve closer to grass or as close as grass as possible, starting around the April twentieth time, and that's mainly to get away from the weather. It, it, you know, there's less potential for those long cold snaps and a pile of snow. And just looking at this, this is a first calf heifer last year, this red brockle face, and this is kind of how we want them to to be able to have um, no interference when we need to go in there when they hit the ground and, and pull them into the barn uh, it's a huge disruption to the mismothering process and um, you know most of these girls will 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 have it here and they'll suck and they they'll be just just fine so uh, we don't have the facilities to house all of them that have at the in a cold snap and, you know, bottlenecking them through a barn really does uh, have a potential to, to spread some, 
disease and bring everything together um, that way. And honestly, it's really, really hard on, on people um, having to, to bring all your calves in in a cold snap, um, as well as the animals. It comes down to sort of an animal welfare thing for, for us, which we're, we're trying to, uh, you know, keep at a high standard there. So that's my, my next tip. Um, number three tip is about kind of the calving herd management. And we want to take a little bit of pressure off our calving grounds at home. And so we leave 100 to 200 head at our north place and they'll they'll calve pretty much on their own. Uh, they get looked at, you know, once once every other day when we feed them and then every other day when we go up there and do some some tagging. Um, and they're considered to be our late calvers, so they don't really start till the end of May anyways. And we actually do quite well on these girls. They about 97 of them percent or 97 percent of them calve and uh, and and they do pretty good. So um, this is how we kind of alleviate uh, our, our calving field pressure. These are the girls trailing home around April 10th. So, um, and then when we get to the calving fields, we we move into the Sandhills calving system. So this is the basic principle where you start calving in one field and um, as they calve, you, you tag them and leave them in the fields that they tag or that they were born in. And then in the two week time is up, we move all the pregnant cows in. So this really puts all the same age calves together in one group. And as they get to that two week to month old time frame, they really start to shed some of these disease pathogens and, and illnesses, um, but they won't pass them on to your newborns because they're in another field. So it kind of just keeps that same age group of calves together. And their pregnant cows then have like a fresh start to calving. It's a brand new uh, calving field that's clean. And, you know, they're not laying in, in you know, bed packs that, the, that have been dirtied for for a month or, or six weeks or whatever it is that you're calving them out for. Um, they're nice and clean and um, it kind of helps helps prevent some disease there. And so here's just um, our map of the Sandhills rotation. So those three are the, the calving fields that we start in with our preg pregnant ones calving. And then as you see, every two weeks, we're just moving through the system of our, our calving fields until, um, we get to the end and we haul the rest up to calf with the, the late calvers at the north end that I showed you there. Uh, this is just showing that when we implemented the Sandhills rotation, kind of the change in the treatments uh, that happened there. Uh, you, can, you can see prior to there was a fair, fair amount of, of treatments that has gone down. And it also shows that um, you know, when you have some treatments between from birth until the till the first month, um, you know, they will continue to to have some issues uh, later on if a calf is stressed out and maybe not doesn't get the colostrum. Uh, this is sort of a, a sign of that uh, uh, issue happening there. Okay, my last like tip here, and um, I, th this is a really important one for me for sure, is your relationship with your veterinarian. And I know everybody needed to kind of get that for your, what is it, the vet client patient relationship so you could get antibiotics for your animals, but they really should be more than just selling you antibiotics. They should be your consultants to help you when you wanna make these management changes such as the Sandhills uh, system, which I give credit to my veterinarians for um, coming up with the, the plan. And, and I was hesitant because you get in the mindset that you've done something the same way for a long time and it's, it's kind of hard to get over that. And they were really amazing at, uh, you know, mapping things out and, and um, walking me through it and, and, talk me into giving it a go and and I I thank them for that right so um definitely to use them for your herd health protocols we have a really strong vaccination um program here we do do the scours vaccinations um so you know it's 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 something that you you should do is have your vet out not just when there's a problem but 
um, when, when you're having a normal day. And the picture here I, I picked because I was pretty lucky to have veterinarians that, that want to come riding with me and want to check pasture. And so they really know what our operation is. And, and so, uh, um, I suggest that you, you do that too. Uh, here's just our, our calving barn office. And that's an example of our, um, protocol book there on the right or on the left. And it's got a little QR code that I don't know. I don't know how to use those because I'm not a young one, but uh, you know, the young, young folks probably know how to use those and pop up to this, this uh, BCRC thing. So I'm, I'm giving them a plug as well. These are great things to have in your, your barn as reminders and for, for new staff and such uh, we've got them all strung up there. And so this is just a, a little bit of a graph to show the last three years and sort of um, the results that we've we've had as far as, uh, you know, our preg check rates are, are pretty strong despite having some drier years. And then, you know, there's the percentage percentage of calves that we've weaned per for every for the pregnant cows we have in the fall to how many are weaned and we are quite successful there. So um, I can't give you tips for being successful if I don't show you that we had some on our place. So, um, yeah, that kind of concludes my tips, um, for, for how we're running our calving and our program here. And, you know, honestly, I think I could have ended on the first tip because that's, that's really the, uh, the top one for me is, is, um, is, is caring about your animals and, and keep keep trugging through that adventure on the ranch. So thanks for listening, and I I hope you guys have, have a great calving season, and uh, that we get some of these raindrops there on the screen. Thank you so much for that, Heidi. That was so great. Um, I just want to reiterate that I did not even bribe these guys to plug our CAF 911 stuff. So that was so great to see in each and every one of your presentation. Um, and just a reminder that those PDFs are all available on beefresearch.ca to download and print off on your own. Um, we also have some at the Calgary office that we can send out to groups and organizations if you guys were interested in any of those as well. So feel free to reach out. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers to turn their cameras back on and we can start the live Q&A. Awesome. Okay, thank you guys all so much again. Um, to start off, we're going to go back to our first speaker um, and with a question of what causes premature expulsion of a placenta before calf delivery. Hmm. What causes it? I guess I, I can really answer that. Um, I, I, I We don't see many of those either. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe Clara, do you have any idea on that one? I was afraid you're going to say that. Um, <laughs> I feel like there, the, there's some nutritional components that we're sus we are suspicious of, but I'm not sure they're proven. You know, I think so. Sometimes we start digging into mineral and vitamin deficiencies, but I'm not sure there's any strong evidence for that. I saw Cheryl Waldner was on the audience, so uh, I'm sure she might have. If anyone has information about that, it'd be Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, we have a question regarding um, efficacy for the NSAIDs. And is there any difference between um, in efficacy between uh, delivering it orally or injectable um, for the cow post calving and for the calves, which is the safest method to provide NSAIDs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... On the cow side, I haven't seen any uh, like any studies that have compared head to head the oral versus injectable. So my understanding is they both work pretty well. Um, and I think cost wise, I can see when you get the pounds of 
um, you know, body weight of a cow that that oral product might be more economical for sure. Um, on the calf side, I'm a little bit apprehensive about giving calves anything orally before they have their colostrum. Um, just cause I, I, I don't know that there's any, any evidence for or against this, but just my own sort of personal, um, concern is I always want colostrum to be the first thing that they get. Um, so I would, I, and that's what we've studied is the injectable stuff. So I'd probably would stick with that. Um, meloxicam does have a longer duration of effect than the ketoprofen. So that's the other big pro for Medicam. Um, I guess full disclosure, they have given us free product for some of these studies, um, but they don't pay me money. Um, but yeah, I think the, um, the, yeah, the injectable one is the one that we have have looked at and and is is pretty safe for those calves and and has longer duration of effect, which, you know, you want to be able to turn these calves out. So we don't want to have to be chasing them down to give them second and third treatments. Have you done anything with the transdermal uh, banami? No, I haven't. That one would be interesting. I would be worried about the cows <laughs> licking it off. Yeah, that's, um, that's a weak cow. one too. I've, I've heard yeah. producers say that, that uh, the, ca the cows tend to like to lick that. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that, I bet. That, that's kind of foreign they will lick but uh as far as the cow goes yeah it's a, it's, a, it's an easy easy yep. to use i guess it'd be interesting to see how it compares with the other ones yeah well and it's got it for the cows you know we're not less worried about that changing physiology like there is in the babies right where so i think any pain mitigation that we know works would make sense if you've got it on farm okay thank you um, going back to, um, Dr. Richard, um, we have a question regarding the slide that you kind of had to rush over and specifically about vitamins and trace minerals, um, and what is recommended and what age to give these trace minerals. I believe they're referring to the neonates. Right. Um, but yeah. if okay. The, um, typically if, if their nutrition is up to snap and the calf has got its colostrum, I don't think. Uh, they really need to, you know, to, to worry about supplementing at birth with that. Uh, it would just be a case where your trace mineral intake for the cows for some reason uh, is subpar that you might, uh, because the calf is going to receive its trace minerals in utero. Uh, the vitamins, uh, vitamin A and D, they can get in the colostrum. So um, if they get colostrum and they get... Uh, uh, and the cows are getting adequate mineral uh, leading up to calving, then probably nothing is required. But uh, maybe for, uh, you know, calves that uh, for some reason, you know, you think they missed their colostrum or, you know, the, the probably a shot of vitamin A and D isn't going to hurt anything. Um, again, if, if the cows are taking a proper mineral, though, they shouldn't need any trace minerals. That's the way I handle that. Thank you. Do any of our other speakers have any comments on trace minerals and calves? Uh, we we don't do any on our um, on our ranch as far as as you know shots after they're born. Uh, we do rely on the cattle to get get their own mineral um, you know needs met, and then it comes through the colostrum. And we I won't, wouldn't say we have many health problems because of lack of those vitamins and minerals. Yeah, just I guess one thing. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Nope. I was just going to add, I guess the one situation where it might be worth digging into is if you are seeing calf health issues, because often we will see scours and stuff like that, where if you look back, there is some deficiencies that are making those animals predisposed. Um, so it is worth if you are having an issue. And like he Heidi said about relationships with your veterinarians, right? Have them come out, do necropsies, grab a chunk of liver, liver and have it tested because we do often see that in out more outbreak situations um, that sometimes those deficiencies are going on in the background. Probably because the cows aren't getting what they should. And I guess just to note too, there are oral uh, supplements too that can be given versus needling. So I guess you could check that out if it is something that you, you know, you find out that you need to, to be using. There's, there is an oral product. So. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. Um, our next question is, what is the recommendation on using Medicam on cow-calf um, after a light pull? Um, is there any benefit or 
is it not very cost effective? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I guess it depends a little bit on your definition of a light pole and everybody, that's always the trick with doing some of this research, right? So um, I'm not sure that we've really dug into that per se, um, but you know, I think anytime where you're putting a little bit more pressure on those calves than what is normally supposed to be happening, um, you know, like Heidi said, sometimes if it just feels like it's the right thing to do, um, sometimes that is enough. Um, you know, I, I, it depends a little bit on your operation, really. If you feel like those calves are looking a little dumpy, um, or slow to get going, even when they're a relatively easy pull, it might be something you want to include. Um, probably good to have a chat with your vet about that specific, um, you know, the specific scenario in your farm, but, um, I can't see it doing any harm, whether or not it pays for itself, can't promise that, but, um, you know, I, I don't think it would be a bad thing. That was a very wishy-washy answer. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Richard or Heidi, do you guys have any other comments? I think that was a pretty good answer, but. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a practicality question. Um, one of our audience members um, are using straps rather than chains for pulling calves. Um, so is there any recommendations? And specifically, they asked if they would need to do a double loop for using those as well. I would suggest doing a double loop because, uh, again, the strain, uh, uh, you know, with with the single and then depending on how hard your pull is going to be is going to make a difference as well. But I think uh, if you have the opportunity to do a double loop, I would do a double loop. I don't use uh, you know, I've never, you know, use straps routinely. Sometimes I get out to, uh, you know, out on the farm somewhere and the guys have straps that are on and, and uh, we use them, but I would, yeah, I would, I would suggest using a double if, if at all possible. And if you're going to use a single, make sure it's, it's on the pasture, not above the uh, fetlock. Yeah, and, and I might add a comment because I think some sometimes people think the straps seem gentler or kinder because they're not like the metal chains seem so harsh, but actual OB chains, like the proper calving chains, the way they're designed, the twists and the link actually don't cut off the circulation on the leg, like they leave spaces versus a strap is actually going to cut off all that blood flow to the foot. So if you're pulling for a long time, they're actually losing blood flow to those limbs. Um, so I, I would, <laughs> the cheeky answer to uh, the strap question, I guess, would be get some chains. Um, but I know people do what works for them and all of that. So, you know, you got to do what you're comfortable with. But there is a reason that we recommend the chains. And it's that that uh, sort of, you don't want to be making a, a tourniquet essentially on their on their foot. So so that's the advantage to using the the proper OB chains. Thank you guys. Um, this question is going to be one for the whole panel, though. I, yeah, I think the the answer will be pretty clear cut. Um, but can you speak to some of the long term consequences um, of not getting colostrum on time? And we can start with Claire because you're the <laughs> one that's in my screen. I, like, I guess you're <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, so uh, there's lots of different ones we can talk about. I guess um, often people like to hear the financial consequences. And if I remember off the top of my head, someone did a study and they found each case of failed transfer of passive immunity cost to the herd, I think, 111 Canadian dollars um, based on sort of all the literature that's out there. Um, so often I get uh, sort of pushback that Flostrum product is expensive, and I, I don't disagree with that. But um, my my other favorite saying is dead calves don't bring any revenue. Um, so if each case costs you $11, $111 and you've got zero calf to wean at the end, um, then, you know, those bags of colostrum start seeming a little less expensive. I know that sounds really cheeky, but um, sometimes I'm cheeky. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's the financial side of it. And that's largely driven by, you know, disease. So those calves are at higher risk of disease. Um, they're at higher risk of, of death and they also have lower gains. Um, studies have looked at that and they have lower average daily gain to weaning as well. So um, all of those consequences, you know, and, and it depends a lot 
you know, there's environmental components to this, of course, right? So if you're calving on grass with very little pathogen challenge, you might get away with a little less resilient colostrum management. Um, but if you're calving in a barn, you might need to be a little more diligent, right? So if colostrum is not the only thing, although I like to believe that it is because that's my area of research, but, um, you know, you also have to consider all the other factors of what's going on in your herd as well. Um, but that wasn't really the question. Um, but yeah, increased disease, increased death, reduced gain and, and economic. Um, and I can pull up specific numbers if people are interested, um, but it's getting late. So I suspect they don't want, want numbers. <laughs> And just to confirm, that is seen all the way up to winning and past winning, correct? Those yeah, I, I don't know if anyone's looked past weaning, but I think you know we generally kind of can extrapolate, right? That sickly calves often stay sickly calves, right? And they don't do as well all the way along. So I'm not sure anyone's looked at you know past immunity versus feedlot performance, um, but I, I think we can probably assume they're never going to be your the best of the best if they didn't get enough. I don't know, Heidi, if you want to, you probably have more long-term um, observation of those calves. Yeah, ab absolutely. A calf that that didn't get the colostrum early enough or maybe not enough or or missed it for a long time. Like sometimes we go out and there's a, a calf wandering around who was obviously a twin or got a little mismothered out there. Um, and we bring it in we're, you know, and have to feed it. it. It takes a little bit to get these ones going. And and if you were to follow them, them through and, uh, and see how their performance was, they're, they're at the bottom end of the, the weaning weight pens. Right. And um, you're totally right. You, you uh, get this, this cow along for all those months and look after it and then, you know, let it fall through the cracks at the end by not jumping in and giving it its colostrum you know, there is no money in a dead calf for sure. And if it's something as easy as intervening and just making sure that they get that colostrum. Um, I believe a calf that gets scours is 30 pounds less in the fall. Like they just never really pick up and recover from that. And mm -hmm. that's the only place that they're going to get immunity from when they're born is in the colostrum. They're, they don't, aren't born with antibodies, antibodies to fight that disease. So uh, it's very important they get their colostrum. Absolutely. I didn't Thank pay her to say that. <laughs> I said the same as you, Claire. <laughs> really? You drank my Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. No, I think it just reiterates how important colostrum management is and to get it in them as quickly as possible. And I found your research results really interesting too, that quality really didn't play a role in that, that one study you looked at when it was all kind of given at that same, at that one hour mark. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, well, I think just in case people are thinking that we want them to like run around and get every calf, uh, you know, jump on them and give them colostrum, you know, I fully realize that the goal is to not have to do this. And I guess another little sort of tidbit, you know, we've been looking at this literature lately, the, the research and um, herds that check to make sure that calves have consumed colostrum. So just looking at utter fullness, you know, warm noses, full bellies, those kinds of things. And just monitoring that everybody got some also have lower um, disease risk in their calves, right? So it's not necessarily about jumping on anybody, but it's also about monitoring and making sure that the calves have all gotten some helps reduce your risk. So it, that's sort of just so you don't think I expect you to all be climbing around and, <laughs> and you know, bulldogging these calves and shoving flostrum in their throats. It's just making sure they get it one way or another, hopefully from mom, right? Yeah, and from my understanding as well, the best option is to get them to get up and suck and get it directly from mom, but then also like right out of the gate, understanding that the the drill in terms of suckling and um, isn't there something with like body position and whatnot, it actually helps to get right into the stomach when they're suckling or mm -hmm. did I make that up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, they, well, yeah, suckling does help get the colostrum to the place where it needs to go to be digested better than tubing, right? Which is part of why we found some of those caps that were tubed didn't get as quite as well because of what you said, right? That the, the, where it goes in the, um, 
in the stomach of the calf is different if they suck versus if they're tubed. tubed. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to what Roger was saying too, about just like getting these calves out, right? Assisting and making sure they're vigorous and all that kind of good stuff. Well, I think you guys might've gotten everyone pretty excited about colostrum because we keep getting <laughs> colostrum questions. Um, and the one that keeps coming up is why not use dairy colostrum? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, well, I think, you know, I still, I drive around the countryside and see dairy cows out nursing orphan calves and I just shudder <laughs> and partially because then, you know, I think you guys had a webinar with Dr. Waldner asking about Yoni's disease, right? And it's like, you know, I think the disease risks are probably first and foremost, right? It's sort of, I, 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 it's not worth bringing in the potential pathogens from another farm, right? Especially when you're giving it to a newborn vulnerable calf, anything that's in there, they're going to absorb and, and potentially get sick. Right. Um, and then the other big thing is the quality, right? So our beef colostrum, 150 grams per liter is sort of typical. And in our dairy colostrum, those guys are happy if they're over 60. Um, so it's just not um, the same. I still... <laughs> I shouldn't tell embarrassing stories in front of 148 people, but um, I remember the first time I saw beef colostrum and I thought there was something wrong with the cow. I was like, this cow has mastitis or her milk looks like yogurt or like banana pudding. It's just a totally different product. Um, so I think those are the two big things. Um, and then I think assuming that your friend, the dairy farmer is going to give you their best colostrum is also, um, you know, maybe you have really good friends, but the, the dairy cows, the dilution just gets so like they dilute so quickly as soon as they start milking their, you know, their udders are huge. And, and so the quality of that colostrum starts dropping very, very quickly. So it'll be like 20 in no time. So you might be getting something even worse than average. Um, so hopefully those are convincing enough reasons. I don't know, Roger, Heidi, <laughs> back me up. <laughs> We're, we're, we, uh, our area has, uh, the, the dairies have totally disappeared pretty much. So we don't deal with it too much anymore. That's, uh, I, I didn't realize it was that much difference between the, uh, how concentrated it was for in, in beef colostrum compared to dairy. And... Thank you guys. Um, I actually got a response from Cheryl Walter regarding oh, good. <laughs> the um, retained placentas um, or the uh, premature placenta expulsion, sorry. Um, she says the study is quite old, but it talks about it being more common when the calf is dead, dying or not presenting properly. So whether it, most commonly backwards, um, but no other risk factors were reported. So yeah, for interest sake. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Um, There was a question and I've lost it now. Um, yeah, we have a, a few questions regarding dam vaccination protocols. So Heidi, would you um, be able to take us through kind of what is done at WA ranches? And then I will like to follow up with the thoughts from the vets themselves, so. Yeah, for sure. And, and it, you know, it kind of comes down to that whole biosecurity issue too. You've kind of have to protect your your herd against all these other exposures that they might might get. Uh, you know, cross fence from neighbors or or wildlife coming through that sort of thing. There's a lot of disease out there, and it's not like you can, you know, put a put them in a barn or something like. You know, it, it it it's kind of a big a big area to try and and protect your herd. So, um, yeah, we we do it uh, for the cows. We do a pre breeding vaccination uh, at branding time or spring processing time. Um, that's kind of your your uh, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. It's a uh, Bova shield, Bova shield gold, right? So that kind of covers that, and you have to do that, you know, thirty days before the bull goes out, and it, it's got the fetal protection stuff in there. Uh, we also do the calves um, at birth. We do do the um, enforce, so kind of the respiratory 
uh, pneumonia type diseases there. And then we booster them at, at the spring again, along with their, their eight way, as well as a bulba shield is then. Um, in the fall, when we, we gather our cattle from the leases and from everywhere, we've started doing a, a pre, pre weaning uh, vaccination on the calves as well to kind of booster them to help them with their, their pneumonias uh, before they get shipped out or before we wean them. And then our cows get boosted every year with the, with the seven or eight way uh, vaccine um, when they're preg checked and our bulls get get that in the fall. They also get a pneumonia kind of the bull shield in the fall and and the Tazvax in the fall um, to kind of keep 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 everything up because, you, you know, it's really cheap, cheap insurance to make sure you're you don't lose uh, too many animals to these diseases that we have vaccines for it, it just it makes a lot of sense for us to to protect your herd um and then of course we do the scours vaccinations and we do do uh two shots uh for the heifers as well so they are boosted um you know a month after they get the first one to help us uh protect kind of against the scours if that uh, gives you an idea of what what we do and why Oh, thanks, Heidi. That's great. Um, I want to pass it over to Roger. And I know that vaccine protocols can be very regionally specific and very operationally specific, depending on what challenges and historical disease outbreaks have occurred. So from your veterinary expertise and your practical side of things, um, what are some of the key vaccines that you would like to see um, producers be giving to their dams leading up to breeding season and just in general to keep them in the breeding herd longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so yeah, we we would recommend a, uh, a modified live IBR B BVD, uh, kind of the cornerstone for the for the cows, uh, you know, just like black legs, kind of a cornerstone for the calves. And then it kind of builds from from there as far as what, you know, what your, your you know, how concentrate your calving, grounds are and and you know what what other vaccines get come into play for for the rest of the you know calves and her uh calves and cows but yeah the modified live ibr bvd and preferably pre-breeding because uh you want the best protection in that first five months of uh gestation and uh you know if you're waiting till the time you're preg checked to booster while well, you've kind of you're well into that if not you know pass it in some cases so pre-breeding is definitely optimal Let's only comment on that and uh, you know i guess other things if you're in a community pasture situation then you know you might be looking at some some other things to add in there uh you know campylobacter and uh, uh you know lepto possibly too so um wildlife can bring leptospirosis into the herd so kind of depends on how you know if you've got uh, contamination of your you know feed sources with wildlife whether you want to need to bring that in so but uh, i think you know by far 90 90 percent plus it's bvd ibr okay Appreciate those comments. Thank you. Claire, do you have anything to add or did they cover it yeah, all? It's, it's my turn to do the BCRC plug. Um, because we I was involved in a project with Joyce Van Donkersgood and Barbara Willem on sort of vaccine protocols for herds. And and so there's a bunch of resources on the BBD website about the core vaccines, which Roger mentioned, as well as sort of some of the risk-based vaccines and how to decide. Um, you know, with your veterinarian, which ones are, are required for your herds. So I guess that's the only thing I have to add is there's lots of resources on the BCRC website about that. Um, so talk to your vet and see where you land. Thanks, Claire, for the comments and for the plug. Always appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's getting a little late here, um, but we did have a few questions regarding scours. So I'm going to ask just kind of a couple on that, and then I will let everyone go for the evening. Um, but the first is, um, can you briefly explain the major differences between bacterial and viral scours in terms of treatment causes detection and prevention? Um, and I'm going to pass this one over to Roger to address first, and then we'll go through the rest of the panelists. 
Okay. As far as the, the difference, it kind of comes down to an age, uh, you know, where the, where the scourge is showing up. If it's, you know, three days and younger, uh, it's probably, a, you know, bacterial origin E. coli is what we're uh, typically dealing with at that point. Um, I would say that, you know, 90% of the scours that uh, I get calls about are calves that are five days to, ten, you know, 10 days to, to 12 days of age um, there. And, and, you know, the vast majority of those uh, come back as being, uh, you know, rotor coronavirus. Um, uh, so, you know, and then your outlier things uh, that you don't, you know, you never want to see and you heard crypto, crypto spir spiridium and, and, uh, and salmonella. Um, but, uh, you know, by far those are kind of most of the scours we're dealing with is viral as far as, uh, you know, um, prevention. It's, it seems we don't. I, or uh, personally, I don't see much uh, E. coli or bacterial scours. It's, and I, you know, I kind of just plug that up to it's, it's the easiest, you know, I guess the best vaccination maybe, but it does a good job on it. It seems that the viral ones, uh, even if you do have what you, you know, consider a good vaccination program, sometimes that gets, you know, that that's what's going to show through as far as treatment of, of it if you're dealing with a viral thing uh you know fluids number one keep that calf hydrated uh just the way those bugs work they damage the calf's intestine uh, it's just like yourself fighting off a cold you got to fight off the virus on your own um so you're relying on your your immunity to do that uh you know those damaged cells of the intestine you know kind of regrow over uh you know a few days so if you keep that calf hydrated and going, um, make sure it's, you know, either sucking or getting X supplemental fluids, electrolytes, um, those cells, you know, get, do regrow, the calf gets over it. So, you know, uh, a lot of guys are, you know, oh, I got to give them scour pills, scour pills, but it's, um, you know, fluids is, is definitely number one. Uh, an antibiotic, you know, unless that calf is, you know, really in, bad shape and flat out and you know you need to you start thinking about you know iv treatment but that's uh, i think in most cases guys can manage the fluids orally uh, and mo uh, uh, my our scour ward is empty we don't we don't have calves in there on iv yet uh, uh, as a rule and i think that's i would say that's the trend in, in rural practice too a lot of those scour scour wards are getting repurposed to maybe parvo dogs or something i don't know but they're definitely don't get the iv treatment i think keep them at home make sure you get the fluids to them and you can do a really good job at home treating them if you do run into problems so um i think that's all i have to say on that thanks roger heidi or claire do you guys have any any additional comments or yeah, I'll, I'll just repeat what kind of Roger said there about the IV or the, the fluids, the electrolytes. If you do catch them early and hit them with that, that that'll uh, keep them from going to an IV treatment, right? And as far as me as a, a producer, when I see a calf with scours, I can't tell you whether it's viral or bacteria, you know, and it really... To me, at that point, it doesn't matter. I just need to to treat it, right? And that's what I get after. And and you treat them the same, regardless of, of what type it is. Um, and one other thing that we've started doing, and that was from our vet, was that we give them some injectable meloxicam or Medicam uh, because it's extremely painful. Like you can just see their guts are just, you know, they're humped up and they they look like they're in a lot of pain. So. I found that that has helped uh, our operation uh, doing that as well as, you know, keeping up on the, on the fluids. Um, another important point there is, is make sure you have separate tubing bags for your sick calves and your uh, newborns. Like that is probably the biggest <laughs> key to when you're treating is, is try and separate those, those germs. Um, we even go as far as, as, you know, washing boots, changing boots and, it's generally one person on the ranch that looks after the turnouts and the older or sick calves that we get. 
And if they do make it back to the maternity barn, they've changed, they've cleaned. And, and we really try to keep those areas separate. And we almost do have a scours area ward too on those few occasions that we, we have to bring one in that, you know, gets chilled or something, or we don't want the coyotes to eat them. Um, you know, so we do have a separate barn just for that. We, we'd never bring a sick calf into our, um, maternity area. So those are kind of my tips with the scours. So those are some really great and really important comments. So really appreciate that, Heidi. Thank you. Um, my last question, selfishly, because I'm curious, is in terms of scours prevention, we talked about vaccinating dams, and we talked about um, the calf vaccination as well. Um, in terms of research or anecdotal experience, which ones are the most effective? Is using both kind of an ideal strategy to have a stacking benefit? Is there research looking into this? Um, I'm interested. So Claire? Oh, I wanna do so many studies on this. <laughs> yeah, I think there's there's not a ton of, there's no evidence that I've seen. Again, I'm self-confident or self-conscious that Cheryl's out there, um, but I, um, I haven't seen any studies looking at both, like a stacking thing. Um, I guess to me, there's different uses, right? If you if you are planning ahead and you know you have scours issues and you know this is part of your management strategy, getting those cow vaccines, into them, um, you know, colostrum is a lot more than just the vaccine, right? It's got fat and minerals and, you know, immune cells and, you know, uh, antimicrobial peptides and all sorts of good things in it. So, you know, I still think colostrum is the best vaccination. And, and so if you can plan ahead and get those damn vaccines in, I think that's gonna be your better strategy. Um, but if you're in the midst of an outbreak, obviously you can't back up the clock and vaccinate those cows. Right. So and it takes it takes three weeks to make colostrum and it takes three more weeks to um, respond to a vaccine. Right. So that's why those vaccines usually have to be given at least a month before um, it's two to three weeks. Sorry. So it has to be given at least a month before calving. You can't get back to that time. Right. So that's where I think those calf vaccines come in as really handy because you can still jump in there and get that immunity into those calves when you can't change the question that you've got from those, those cows. Um, whether you could do both on top of each other, I haven't seen anything um, out there. Um, but yeah, I would always do the cows if I could. But it's a good tool to have in your toolbox, I guess, if that answers the question. I don't know, Roger, what's your experience with those? Yeah, I think the less that uh, you have to mess around with the calf, uh, so yeah, I like, I like getting in it to the cow and, and, you know, just making sure that, uh, you might have, have some on hand for those calves that don't get colostrum for whatever reason. Um, uh, you know, but, to uh, be by far the minority. So. Thank you both. Heidi, any additional comments regarding scour vaccines at all? No, we, we use them and I have to believe they're, they're working. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's about it. Heidi believes in them so much. She wouldn't let me do a study where she didn't, she had to have a control group. That's how much she believes in them. <laughs> She's like, no, I won't not do it. Risk. It was a pretty big risk. And yeah. I'll forgive right. you. Yeah. I've got to protect my girls. I've got to protect my I, cat. I, that's what I love. Gosh, about you. <laughs> for sure you're not going to be doing stuff with the calves there. In most cases, you're going to come out and hopefully that calf's had its suck already. So, you know, yeah. well, you can't see in your situation that. It's right. Yeah. Something to do the calf with. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. We still have a ton of questions in the chat and unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, but if you would like to reach out to myself or anyone at BCRC, or I'm going to volunteer our panelists who would be more than happy to answer any of your questions by email. Um, a lot of these are vet specific questions as well. So um, maybe this is a chance to start a conversation with your local vet and really build that VPCR, vet patient client relationship. Um, but other than that, I want to thank you everyone who 
stayed on a little bit later, um, everyone who joined us in general for the webinar, and especially thank you to our three panelists. It was such a great webinar. I learned so much. It was so informative, and it's a really important topic. So again, thank you so much. And with that, I'll let you all have the rest of your evenings. Hey, thanks, Sydney. Sydney. Bye.